welcome to our GTA Spotlight session. Actually, the first Spotlight session, uh, we, you know, we renamed the GTA Powwow to GTA Spotlight. Oh, and that is the first one. And thanks to Maria Aragon and Steffi Schwertfeger, we got a new trailer and we got, and also to Anja Hanisch, we got new, a new logo, new design and also a new trailer. And uh, I'm happy to welcome all of you here to our GDTA session, which is trying uh, to happen every month and to join the global design thinking community. And uh, I see already so many people from all around the world, community members, GDTA members, and uh, yeah, brief, uh, some uh, brief notes. Uh, we do first time, we do just a call here on Zoom. And you know, we don't do it in a webinar mode. We do it always in an open mode. And uh, please use the chat while we have our speakers talking. Raise your hand, you know how that works uh, with the reactions. Um, in, in the time where we have the presentations, it is best or is recommended to hide the non-video participants. Uh, you find that in the video settings and uh, please switch off your video and microphone during presentation so we have a good recording also and you have the best view and uh, yes you can choose between the speaker view and the gallery view as you know to make it as compatible as possible for you and i'm happy now to welcome our guests as you have seen in our little trailer and uh, you read, we have here today, we have, uh, first of all, Hoda Mostafa, Director Center of Center for Learning and Teaching, and also a professor at the American University in Cairo. And uh, she's uh, joined by Reham. And uh, there's also Richard Paris, the founding director of the HPI D school at the University of Cape Town. Um, and he is joined by Putehi. And uh, I'm looking forward to welcome them because they are recently finishing a highly interesting uh, joint project, uh, which was uh, working uh, in the, or which, which was joining forces in Africa, and they called their talk today, building a global virtual d-school and uh, what kind of role co-creation and collaboration will play. And I'm, I like, I know both of the institutions and you saw in the video, you saw some pictures from American University uh, in Cairo in the campus. And those were real pictures that because that campus is already there. Uh, and you saw also some uh, computer pictures of the new building in Cape Town. And that building is under construction yet. It looks already live, uh, but uh, Richard was just telling me there is, it's still in the very early phase of construction, but 2022 will be open. And uh, so I'm really happy to have you here to have the four of you, five of you, here um no i see just yeah the four no richard so but uh, hoda is going to start and we have also a little interactive session uh, so the the whole thing here is set up in a way for those who, who are the first time here uh we have about 30 minutes maybe a little bit more because we have several speakers today uh, uh, the first half of our hour is actually dedicated to the speakers. And then we have an open discussion and we usually end at after one hour, dot sharp. Uh, we don't have a live uh, transmission today to, uh, to YouTube. We just have it here interactively. And after the hour, for those of you who still have time, we do kind of non-recorded, um, get together in a more or less fireside mode for that some private chat. But first of all, please welcome Hoda Mustafa, Richard Paris, and the teams here to their presentation. Thanks you very, thank you very much for joining and being a part of the, and actually 
being the first and giving the premiere to the GDTA spotlight. You're muted, Hoda. Okay, all right. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm happy to be here today representing in the spirit of uh, co-creation and collaboration, um, my colleagues and friends uh, from uh, the Hazel Plattner D School, the University of Cape Town and from the American University in Cairo. My name is Hoda Mustafa. I am a professor of practice and I am the director at the Center for Learning and Teaching, where I also lead the design thinking initiative at the American University in Cairo. Um, I'm here with Riham from AUC, um, Richard Patehi and Lucille uh, from the D School at the University of Cape Town. And uh, we're really excited to be here. We will be um, handing off to each other, so bear with us. Um, and let us know if things get choppy on my end. Hopefully my internet will uh, survive. All right, so what we'd like to share with you today um, is what we'd like to uh, call the spirit and ethos of co-creation and collaboration, which is what brought us all together through the Global Design Thinking Alliance, but also uh, through how AUC started to get involved in design thinking from the very beginning through our collaboration with, the, with HPI D School through Uli and Claudia, where it all started. Um, and finally, or I'll move on to talking a little bit about an AUC experience in which we also relied on the Global Design Thinking Alliance to leverage resources in our institution where we don't have a D school, but we do have a lot of passionate educators and coaches and people who care a lot about integrating design thinking into our experience. Um, I'll hand it over to Richard and Lucille Patehi and Raham. We'll talk about our DT for Africa experience. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we can leverage global collaboration and co-creation to build this seed of using, of course, the Global Design Thinking Alliance, but also maybe other ideas people may have on how to build this idea of a global D-School, especially with what COVID has brought to us with this idea of virtual and hybrid and all the opportunities that has opened up to us. And I think we touched on that at our last uh, spotlight session on how, what, could never have happened maybe two or three or four years ago, now can most likely happen in the virtual world. And finally, we have a five minute community exchange activity at the end and then questions, of course. Um, so what we could do in the past was put together pieces of a puzzle. We thought we knew what we wanted, whether it was a D school, whether it was a building, whether it was a program, and this was how I personally looked at what I wanted to build for AUC. Uh, we knew we wanted to co-create something. We knew we needed to collaborate, but we knew there were many, many missing pieces. And before I got into this space of the Global Design Thinking Alliance and started working with all these amazing people, I always looked at it as a puzzle with missing pieces and what was missing. Um, but with a puzzle, you kind of know what the picture is. You have a box, you've got a picture on the picture box, and there's only one way you can put together a puzzle. You can't put a puzzle together except in one way. But when you think about it a little differently, and that's what I'm inviting you, all of us today, to think about, is to look at it a little differently and to think about it more as a quilt. And if you're familiar with quilt making, and as a young child, um, I actually loved to put together quilts, is when you put together little pieces of often mismatched or often different pieces of material to put together something beautiful. And in the end, you have no idea what it's gonna look like. You have no idea uh, how the pieces will fit together, but you do know that it will end up being something beautiful. And in this sense, co-creation and collaboration or how we envision perhaps a global collaboration coming together in a virtual space or in a hybrid space or in a sometimes physical, sometimes blended, sometimes whatever it may be, will be more of a quilt and less of a puzzle. And with just by looking at the map, you can see that we have so many pieces of this quilt already in place where everyone can put a little bit of generosity and come together and build something amazing and beautiful. 
Our first attempt at doing this, again, we've been working with HPI for several years in a global design thinking uh, week. We've run it several times with help from HPI, and this time we basically did it ourselves. But we also needed resources and help, and we relied on a call to global design thinking coaches in a virtual collaborative workshop in which we prototyped using this idea that something creative is basically a sum of its parts. We had AUC coaches and leads. We had coaches from the Global Design Thinking Alliance, from Ireland, from South Africa, from South Africa, from Chile, um, and from Egypt. And we were also able to build capacity within our institution to come together and to build a blended program. But we were also able to bring in faculty who had never taught design thinking, but were familiar with design thinking and include them as faculty mentors. And this immersive blended program was in, it, in itself an experiment. We were prototyping many moving parts. We had no idea. And as you can see, it kind of looks like a quilt. We have multiple partners. We had a Mountain View, which is a big real estate company as a challenge partner. We worked with our newly founded innovation hub, our career center, the center for learning and teaching, students, coaches, mentors. So in essence, it was a quilt and it came together actually quite nicely. And we prototyped um, many different moving parts. If you're interested, I can you know, meet with you later. We can talk about it after this is over. Uh, but it came together quite nicely and we prototyped a coach light using master boards on mural. We had faculty mentors come in and the motivation at the end of the program was that students, once they finished this program and got their certificates, it was a two week program, would actually apply for an internship. There were lots of learnings and I'm not gonna go through them all because many of us know that at the end of the day, there are learnings for students, there are learnings for coaches, there are learnings for mentors, but there were so many surprises um, at the end of this experience. And I'm gonna leave the time for the team from DT for Africa because we learned a lot and Reham was heavily involved in the DT for Africa. I think she was able to take a lot of the learnings from the AUC experience because we were prototyping so many moving parts and so many new things into the DT for Africa. But this idea of a proof of concept, this idea of trying out new things in a very safe space with the support of international coaches who could give us continuous iterative feedback on how the program was going was extremely uh, beneficial. I'm going to hand it over to Richard and the team, and I'll be coming back with an activity near the end. Thanks, Soda. Um, yeah, so to build on, on the concept uh, how it is presented, um, we decided what we should do is, is sort of conceptualize a program where we can start to um, collaborate across other institutions um, and specifically perhaps look at institutions that um, lack the resources um, and the capacity to even run a simple design thinking um, program. So um, the D school at the uh, University of Cape Town and um, University of Cairo, we sat down to conceptualize a Africa-wide program where we could bring in a couple of other institutions that are based in Africa and, and sort of run a bit of an experiment where we can bring resources to the table. They can also bring their students and really try a, a sort of an Africa-wide, regional-wide uh, program where students from different institutions could actually mix with each other. Um, next slide, please. Who's holding the slide? There we go. So just a, a bit of brief, uh, you know, one of our mandates as the Hesse Platten School of Design Thinking at the University of Cape Town is to see how we can build out design thinking more on the, on the African continent and how we can start to partner with various institutions um, and start to almost sort of build satellites across, across Africa. And with Hoda and her team, obviously also based on, on the continent, we felt let's let's join forces and run a pilot where we can start to invite in some of the other uh, universities that aren't part of the GDTA, um, but yet we know would be interested in perhaps becoming partners um, or members of the GDTA, but certainly they would be keen to bring some students to programs and, and for us to start to mix the students, um, student teams up from, from different regions of, of Africa. So next slide, please. So as a D school um, at UCT, we've got sort of a, a number of key focus areas um, in which we're gonna build out over, um, over the continent. 
Uh, one is the teaching and learning side, which is very much programs for students and professionals. Uh, there's a design thinking research piece and facilitation and support. So, so this focus is very much on the first circle, very much uh, about how can we build an uh, African-wide program where we can partner with institutions across Africa um, and, and somehow perhaps support or provide um, resources to those institutions that don't have any resources at all. And in fact, don't even have design thinking on their radar screen as possibly a program. And, and could we use um, part of the GDTA resource network, ourselves and, and Hoda's team, to introduce them to what we do and see if we can start to, to create, a, a, I guess, an interest and a demand. So we, we decided to pilot a program. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Lucille, who's the head of programs, just to take us take you through a little bit how we conceptualized the program, and then she'll hand over to the team that actually delivered it. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. So to speak to the um, to the objectives, um, Rhoda and Richard have been chatting about offering an African Design Thinking Week, which would have been equivalent to the HBI's GDTW, but it needed to have an African focus. Um, so we chose four partners and the partners was the D School. Well, what we one of the four partners, the D School at UCT, um, American University in Cairo, the Ashesi University in Ghana and the Design Kenya Society student chapter in Kenya. For this particular project, um, we had UNEP that was brought on board as the uh, challenge partner. And um, these were the four institutions that kind of managed the program. Okay, next, thanks. So the program, it, um, it ran from the 15th to 16th of July. So it just finished about a week or so ago. It was designed as an online program. Um, the design team were mainly AUC, RIAM, and uh, Butei from the T-School. The other institutions, they helped with student enrollment and they also provided um, coach, coaches for the program. Initially, we started off when we had the conversation to deal, to have 24 uh, participants, so six from each of the institutions. We eventually moved this to about nine for each institutions, and this was for in case of drop-offs from the program. The idea was to pilot and test the program uh, initially with the first 24 or however many attended. And the idea is that it would be scaled up so that it could be reach more people. Um, the pilot co was coach intensive. So we had lots of coaches initially. The idea is that we test this and I think we could use quite a few um, ideas from the AUC initiative that happened in how we could possibly do a more coach light program um, that would be easy to scale, but also use less resources. Um, the, resource, the program was designed to run over a two-week period. It was both synchronous and asynchronous sessions, total of six days. And some of the benefits that we identified for the students would, would be that they would have um, enhanced skills for future work, uh, introduce students to diverse multidisciplinary teams, discover digital learning tools, and build creative confidence. I will now hand over to Riham and Putei about the experience. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Lucille, uh, for that. Um, so Riham and myself uh, will go through the next few slides. And um, yeah, we'll just give you an, a general overview of how design thinking uh, in Africa program uh, went. And this is from our perspective. And we will cover the structure of the program. And Lucille has already mentioned uh, just a few points, um, as well as the successes, uh, some constraints um, that uh, we really encountered or the challenges. And we will also share the learnings um, at the end. Next slide, please. So before I go any further, um, I wish to just introduce the team um, that was involved in the delivery of this program. And um, they are the ones who made this program possible. Um, and each and every uh, individual in this team played a critical role uh, in making this program a success. Um, so the program was uh, consisted 
of some coaches from the D school uh, at UCT. It was about five of them. And then we had uh, also one individual from Kenya um, who, uh, who was a coach. And as Lucille mentioned, um, we had some uh, other coaches from other institutions that uh, are shadow coaches. And uh, their main role was actually to support uh, the main coaches as well as uh, learn um, how to coach uh, in, the, in the process. Um, next piece. So I would uh, start with the structure of the program itself. Uh, it was over a period of two weeks and the number of hours in total was about 30. And um, this consisted of about six live sessions. Um, each session was about four hours. And uh, then there was a synchronous work, uh, which involved things, uh, activities like interviews or going to do testing or just uh, doing a whole lot of research in terms of uh, the challenge context uh, itself. Uh, the digital platforms that we use uh, were Zoom as well as Miro. And the communication tools involved um, were the emails as well as WhatsApp. So we used WhatsApp uh, to create team groups uh, when the program had already started. And this program, uh, like Lucille mentioned, was designed for about 36 participants, uh, nine from each institution. And the idea was to have about six teams of six. Uh, this was the plan, uh, but the reality was a little bit different. And I will share about that uh, when uh, I unpack it just a little bit around the constraints. Um, I will hand over to Reham uh, to share the successes first. Thank you, Patina. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so part of the successes of uh, most of the design thinking programs, I believe that I participated in was always the diversity, whether from the coaches side or from the participant side. So I believe uh, that the diversity that was among the different participants coming from different countries in Africa actually added a lot of value uh, to that. And the, um, also the choice of the challenge partner and the challenge choice on so many levels. So the challenge uh, was about mobility. And I think that um, helped a lot because it was very familiar to the participants, which enabled them to be uh, more connected to it, as well as also uh, being able to experiment different approaches to the empathy and the research work that they did. So they didn't only focus on interviews, they also did some observations, it enabled them to do some immersive activities as well. And I think that was uh, part of the successes that even uh, the participants as well as the coaches felt. Um, the structure of the program and the flexibility and freedom uh, for the coaches to choose the different tools. So as we did, uh, as Hoda mentioned, um, we did that also with the coaches when we were doing the um, uh, the first blended format of the design thinking workshop that we did at AUC, where we have like a master uh, board and then the coaches are able to choose from it the different tools that they feel comfortable or want to use with their teams according to their own coaching style, for example. I think that gave uh, the coaches a flexibility and it gives them also the space uh, to feel comfortable in which uh, tool to choose. Um, also the usage of Miro. Uh, I think it's a very interesting collaborative tool. Um, and uh, I think it helped also not only uh, that the students or the participants themselves feel uh, comfortable. Of course, uh, part of the might, might be some challenges that I think that you will cover also later on in the constraints, the familiarity with the platform. Uh, but it was very, uh, um, it was a, an added value uh, to the program for sure. Um, I believe that uh, the flexibility in managing dropouts, because uh, as Patihi was mentioning, we had a plan and then the reality uh, was not exactly that, but I believe that Patihi and myself and the rest of the team as well, uh, with the coaches and everything, their flexibility and ability to cope with that, um, I think managed a part of, uh, big part of the successes. Um, I added a code, I'm not sure it's not showing on the slide for some reason, uh, but one of the students, uh, one of the quotes that we captured from the students was that they were very appreciative of the design thinking for Africa because it was a, a great platform to network and share ideas. 
and an opportunity for them to learn about different things. And I think that also adds to what Hoda was mentioning about the sharing part in the diversity. And with that, I hand it over to Kutihi to talk more about the constraints. Great, thanks, Riham. Um, so in terms of the constraints, uh, the biggest one was the high dropout rate. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, we plan to have about 36 um, participants in this program. And uh, this were all that we, we accepted, but only about 16, one six of them finished the program. Uh, so that's about 55% dropout uh, rate. Um, so some didn't show up at all um, on day one, but then some dropped off as uh, we went along uh, with, with the program. Um, so we started with six teams, but uh, we ended up um, with about four teams. So just to emphasize the point that Reham was talking about in terms of just managing that, um, just the different stages of the program, we would match the teams um, uh, at appropriate uh, design thinking phases in order for them to have a full experience of design thinking. Um, so that was, that was one. The second part uh, of that was the poor internet connectivity for both students and coaches in different countries. And um, really this caused a lot of dis, uh, disruption in the process. And um, some students would actually fall off uh, the call and then not come back at all. Uh, but by some, uh, the ones that would come back, it would really take a coach a long time to try to catch them up. Um, and for the fact that we didn't have a lot of time, we only had four hours in a day and there were a lot of activities to, to cover. This really took, um, this was a little bit challenging. It took a lot of time to try to do that. Um, and uh, one other thing was that there were some other issues that were beyond our control, just like power cuts um, or when you have load shading uh, at a specific uh, area, then sometimes the coaches would fall off. But the mere fact that we had like some shadow coaches, they would be able to step in uh, every now and then in order to, to support. Um, the other constraint was uh, around the time difference uh, between countries. Um, it was very difficult to get to do the asynchronous work uh, simply because uh, you would find that in South Africa or Cairo, it's, it's about 10 o'clock when we start the process. And uh, in Ghana, for instance, they are about two hours behind and in Kenya, about an hour, an hour ahead. So as much as we envisioned them having the entire day in between to do asynchronous work, um, that meant that actually when you combine all the productive hours, uh, looking at uh, Ghana, which is a little bit behind, and then Kenya, which is a little bit ahead, they had about four hours. So as much as we thought we had a lot of time for to allocate for them to be able to do asynchronous work, uh, that proved to be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, from there, the other thing was around uh, in terms of uh, the time differences. Some students, for example, um, we, we had um, some interviewees planned um, for them to come interview. Uh, but because of the time difference, some of them got confused. So they didn't log on at all. They only came about two hours late, uh, which meant they missed some of their slots uh, that they were supposed to take actually to conduct interviews and uh, do the testing. Um, so this was a little bit difficult to manage because you would actually communicate that, okay, this is the time, but then you include um, the specific time zone, but for them when they convert it, uh, it's like it's, it's another layer, uh, another step uh, for them to, uh, to figure out the time. So that proved to be um, a little bit of a challenge. From there, uh, doing empathy work during COVID. Um, so this was quite challenging because they needed to, the students themselves needed to balance and us, we needed to balance uh, work that needs to be done in the program as well as safety. Uh, for example, in South Africa was on lockdown level four uh, at that point, which meant that um, there wasn't like a lot of free movement. And because of the context of the challenge, which was around mobility, uh, the students needed to interview or engage with some passengers, some taxi drivers. So that was a little bit difficult and it limited uh, them from engaging um, with uh, a lot of stakeholders that were actually, uh, that could have contributed a lot uh, in the challenge itself. Uh, 
from there, uh, the last one is uh, the length of the program. Uh, it was a bit short. And um, we felt rushed at specific points of the process, uh, but we really felt this towards the end of the program whereby uh, the teams were doing the asynchronous work where they needed to go out and actually do the testing um, of their um, solutions. From there, they needed to unpack those um, as well as iterate on the spot and start to prep for presentations. So all this happened um, on a Thursday when the presentations were on Friday. So that was really, really hard uh, to actually bring these students um, that are from uh, a whole bunch of African countries uh, with different time different time zones and actually to try to have the accountability. Uh, it was also difficult to try to pair them uh, with their fellow teammates because now they are in, uh, in, in different countries. And uh, uh, so that was, that was th th those were the main constraints. And uh, I will hand it over to Riham um, to just uh, conclude with the learnings. Thank you, Pati. Yes, so uh, definitely time is a factor and it has like a pebble effect. And it's not only as for the program time, we also felt it um, with the choice uh, by the time uh, we chose the challenge partners, we started the communications, we sent out uh, all the materials, all that um, uh, definitely um, going forward, we'll, we'll plan that to be uh, way earlier uh, to make sure that we are able to have the enough time to actually um, uh, recruit the participants that needs to come in and, and so on and so forth. Uh, also having a dedicated person for the deck, uh, for the tech part, uh, uh, because Pati and myself were amongst ourselves uh, doing like um, managing everything uh, in the back scene was also uh, doing the tech support in terms of breakout rooms, any drop uh, because of connection or anything like that, we needed to handle this. So I think having a dedicated person uh, for that tech support is very, very important. Um, adding on to what Patihi was saying concerning the length of the program, uh, it's not only about the live sessions, it was more uh, increasing uh, the asynchronous days where they're able to do interviews because of the time. And as Patihi also men uh, mentioned, the situation with COVID, um, they were not able to uh, have a lot of um, interviews or observations done beyond uh, the uh, challenge partners uh, interviews that they uh, were able to do. Uh, some, some teams, of course, did some, but it's, it was limited because of the time and because of uh, the COVID situation. Um, for us, uh, our recommendations and part of what we discussed as the next step is the opportunity for knowledge sharing among coaches. And I think this came also from the feedback that the coaches even mentioned, uh, that it's, it's always uh, an added value to see different coaches coming from different uh, areas around the globe, not only in Africa, to add what, how, they, uh, uh, how they coach, their, their coaching style, what type of tools they, uh, do they use, because at the end of the day, um, that also gives value to the participants and gives value to the program itself. Um, I think the, um, the idea of having shadow coaches, I think was a success. Uh, but what we would like to consider also in the coming steps is to actually prepare those shadow coaches and identify their roles uh, and be able to give them some sort of orientation with the tools that are going to be uh, presented uh, so they can support at any time the coaches if the coach has any kind of drop or also take some uh, other roles off from the shoulder of the coach, uh, him or herself. Um, now, part also because of the dropouts, I, and I think this is something maybe uh, that I felt and, and I believe would, uh, would also agree that the incentives, giving incentives to participants, uh, this is something that we tried out with the Mountain View Challenge, for example, that we did recently, is that uh, other than the certification that we gave uh, for participants, there was also the application for internship. So these type of incentives, regardless of what type of incentive it is, it increases the possibility uh, that students stay within the program and not drop out. Uh, so this is something definitely to put into consideration going for, uh, forward. So, uh, but overall, I think it was a great experience and seeing um, how also 
each team came out with the solutions that they did and, and, the, and the choice of uh, the challenge partner that was very, very uh, helpful with uh, providing us with people to interview and, and uh, being there for questions and all of that added uh, a huge factor to the success of the program. And by that, I definitely came up. Thank you. Thanks, Rehan. Thanks, Patehi. And thank you, Lucille. All right. So we're going to move on to the final activity. Uh, and then we'll have time for questions. I think we're on time. Um, so a few years back, a speaker, and his name escapes me right now. Um, but this was the first time I heard the term academic generosity used in a context in which um, time people's time and knowledge and expertise became um, a service or I, I don't want to say a commodity, but became something that could actually be exchanged or, or bartered within, within a group of people. Um, and I fell in love with this term. And I thought, you know, why don't we try and co-create a new definition for academic generosity within the GDTA through a very quick activity um, and we're going to use one of the liberating structures. If you're not familiar with liberating structures, and I think many of you already are, um, these are very quick microstructures for facilitating large group discussions like the one we're in now, where we can uh, rapidly share challenges, ideas, and expectations, and also build new connections. Because there are a couple of people here that I don't know, many people who I don't know, and some people that I do know. Um, this is one of the liberating structures. It's called impromptu networking. And I've asked the um, HPI team to put us into uh, breakout rooms, but not now. We're just going to wait for a few moments uh, of three people per breakout room. And there's a little invitation for you all. Um, this is also something we've tried at AUC. And these are called community exchange commitment cards. So in seven minutes, I'd like you to share one thing you can bring to the table that could possibly potentially help build this virtual D school. You may have heard something today, a constraint or a success or something that gave you a seed of an idea of something that you would like to do or to contribute or something that you've seen work at your institution or seen work somewhere else, um, where design thinking is a service. It could be a coach exchange or a coaching opportunity or a toolkit or a template or an idea. Um, it could be a challenge partner that you heard that really wants to work in Africa or wants to work in the Middle East. Uh, a curricular map, um, an idea for academic integration or something, a very small idea or a very big idea. It's really up to you, uh, but we're going to network for seven minutes. And to do that, each room, each Zoom room is going to work on a slide. I'm going to ask Riham in the chat to put the link to this Google slide deck. I hope Riham can hear me um, and just pop it in the chat. Uh, you can all edit these slides and depending on which Zoom room you're in, all you need to do is to type your name and or your institution um, and your community exchange idea or contribution. Like I said, it can be something really tiny or something really big. It doesn't matter. It can be something simple or something complicated. There are no constraints here. Um, and again, hoping that we come up with a beautiful quilt today uh, at the end of this session. Okay, so once you're in your room, uh, you can find your slide, claim your slide, and I will stop sharing. And Riham, thank you, has put the uh, slides in the chat. You can just grab the link to the presentation. You should be able to edit the slides. All right, great. People are actually coming back. Great. Okay, excellent. So would somebody like to share some of their ideas? I mean, I'm going to dig into the slides later, of course, but would someone like to share some of their ideas or ask some questions or make some comments? We have 10 minutes left before the top of the hour or six minutes left. Feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself. Maria, I see you've unmuted yourself. Yes. Maria? Yes, me, please. right? Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Just, uh, just a couple of uh, ideas I, I wanted to, I wanted to, to I wanted to share. Um, 
we had an experience with uh, Rush in uh, Russia uh, with Moscow city government while we were spreading some kind of a close to your ambition initiatives among our regions. And uh, we were working with students and uh, young professionals. And uh, we were thinking about how to make it like pop up and spread very uh, intensively. Uh, we decided to apply small funding, really small funding, just like a sign, for example, from one to ten dollars to each student who would like to make an open lab or who would like to dedicate ideas and uh, gather together based on the educational institution uh, they have uh, a program with, uh, based some small lab their own with their forces with ju just our methodological support and it really it really worked very very well because the number of money didn't mean to them uh, just the creative confidence sign uh, the sign of the support meant a lot so we got thousands of really motivated uh, pitches uh, before the project and uh, they were just we haven't seen such motivated people because uh, Finally, we understood that uh, students who were like waiting for someone to came to them because like young people, we are always very, um, very nervous about whether the world needs us. <laughs> so and this sign was like a cre creative confidence um, platform for them uh, that we need you. And they came in and they were making small workshops and small open labs and social services across the regions of uh, Russian uh, country. And uh, it was a really um, a good approach uh, for us to get not only motivated, but also a lot of creative ideas uh, and people who would like to stay further. So as soon as you have an ambition to unite the continent, I think our experience uh, might uh, uh, help you in creating your own ideas. Thank you so much for this Thank task. You. Thank you, Marianne. And you just gave me an idea, actually, that co-creation has to include the students, right? So that's, yes. that's fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much. Next, if I'm pronouncing it. Yeah, your hand was up. And then Ying. Yeah, thank you for, I'm, I'm out in the Stockholm archipelago. I hope you hear me from very far, but very interesting talk. And, and uh, it's much in line with the Stockholm University uh, idea and the Swedish uh, government through the development agency of SIDA that we will approach the sort of middle of Africa. So, so the AUC is in the top of Africa and the Cape Town is in the bottom of Africa, I still say so. And, and how do we reach the middle? So it's very interesting and we would very much like to keep in touch with you. Uh, CEDA is working in Botswana, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and maybe South Sudan, Sudan as well. How can we uh, sort of enlarge the efforts in this kind of area and how can we reach some kind of, of scalability? Very interesting. So just reaching out the hand and how can we keep in touch with this very interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah, Thank hi. you. I, I think uh, Richard and I will agree and everyone on the team, we're most, uh, most definitely willing. DT for Africa. <laughs> Go team. <laughs> Ying. Yeah, hi. Also, I want to thank you for a very enlightening talk. And uh, I, I, I met with Colinia uh, in the breakout room. And one of the things we were talking about, how do you deal with time differences where um, it, it could be a challenge? And also, um, students, if they don't know each other that well, they may feel uncomfortable uh, afterwards listening to recordings and things like that. So we determined that the, one of the issues uh, one of the things we might want to resolve is to provide maybe some pre-activities before you offer this uh, design thinking session for the student to be able to get to know each other better before you, you do the session. So then, then whether they are in the classroom or maybe afterwards they can check the recording when they feel comfortable with each other, they may collaborate and co-create more offline and then, then online. So uh, one, one actually idea I had based on my experience working with students is um, we, we started to use something called a 90 second video. So I asked the students or entrepreneurs just to 
provide a just record a 90 second video. It, that could be about themselves, so it could be about an idea, it could be a meeting status check. Um, the, the thing is that gave them way of thinking and reflecting on what they do, who they are, and it gives people who want to know them a opportunity to spend little time, but to get to know them very quickly. And, and that way they can reach out afterwards um, to talk about things that uh, they have in common and things like that. So, so that could be one activity, yeah. Yeah, those are two really good ideas actually. And I know Rehem is the master note taker. She always takes notes, um, but you know, like digital calling cards and they can exchange those later. Or uh, we actually tried this idea of an onboarding day before our AUC program. But it was more to um, introduce them to the program and to mural. But you're right. I think it's more important for them to actually get to know each other um, because there's lots of time for them to figure out mural and know about the challenge partner later. But it's getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. So that's really good. That's a really good observation, actually. Thank you for that. Yeah, excellent. Good. Welcome. Um, do we have any more questions? All right, uh, Richard, actually, do you want to? Well, we are so well in time now. <laughs> I, can't I, I was going to ask if Richard wanted to wrap up with anything before yeah. we're at five o'clock. No, I think very briefly. Thanks, guys. I mean, there's some, some great ideas uh, coming out. And, uh, you know, we, we in our group talked a little bit about the project partner and, um, you know, the relevance needing one, which has um, regional and almost global relevance so that the students, when you mix the students up, they can they can relate to it. So if it's too regional and it's too much of a local problem, then, then students from other areas might not fully understand it or, or be able to connect to it. Um, and that sort of opened up the conversation around the development agencies, uh, United Nations, World Bank. Um, it could be an interesting way to uh, knock on some doors, which maybe we haven't knocked on before, um, and and could could yeah could open up some new conversations at a at a project partner level, which could be quite exciting. Yeah. Um, thank thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for sharing. I think there, and also for setting up that little um, uh, that little interaction. Uh, I think there were so many. I'm just scanning a little bit through the through the pages. There are so many interesting ideas, and uh, and thank you very much actually for sharing about the Design Thinking Africa activity um, and, uh, and also the learnings you had. Um, thanks a lot, um, and a big a big applause to all of you, to Hoda, to Richard to Reham and to Putehi. And last but not least, sorry that I forgot you at the beginning, Lucille, uh, thanks to, to all of you for, for sharing that. And now the, the uh, hour of our official uh, spotlight, GDTA spotlight is over and we will soon stop the recording. But before we stop the recording, I think Steffi will show a slide with the next things coming up. And you know that Global Design Thinking Alliance is having, we try to do every month the spotlight session, but since uh, there's a little bit of vacation time now in August, uh, we have the next, our next event will be the Global Design Thinking Conference, uh, which will happen on September the 2nd. Uh, it's a full day conference like last year. It's a 12 hour conference and the focus is uh, policy innovation, is public innovation. And we call the whole thing the Global Policy Innovation Lab from going from local to global. And all of you are invited. We, do, we are just in the preparation phase setting up um, a highly interesting course of uh, panelists, speakers, keynoters, openers, and also mini workshops and interactive sessions for the day. And the whole Global Design Thinking Alliance community with 22 members and uh, two new members actually and i think Anio Ban, who is one of our new members is also here uh, um, from india uh, that they, they will contribute and they are all preparing already we had a great talk in the morning with uh, with Maria Stashenko from Moscow uh, and learning uh, incredible things about the Moscow government, what government, uh, what they are doing right now. 
and uh, I'm looking forward to this event. So in August, we will not have a spotlight session, uh, but just be prepared September 2nd, uh, a full day starting in the morning and going in the at nine o'clock at the Central European time, running until nine o'clock uh, Central European time. And we start in Australia and Asia, and then we move to Europe, Africa, um, and North America, South America um, during the day. Uh, will be highly interesting. Thank you very much for sharing the slide now. And uh, is there another another one, uh, Steffi, to share? I think that is the last one here. The, the goodbye, yeah. the official goodbye session. Uh, and uh, so th thanks a lot. And I think we can now stop recording. And for all of you who have a little bit time left and want to share some ideas and talk with our guests here from Cairo and, and Cape Town, uh, please stay online. <laughs>